Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I've always wondered what makes us think the way we do and how people can have such seriously different views of the same issue. I'm hoping that Michelle Fine, Distinguished Professor of Social Psychology, Urban Education, and Women's Studies at CUNY's Graduate Center and a founder of the Graduate Center's Public Science Project, can help us understand what's happening to people in their lives. So, hello. Hello. <laughs> how, how does this phenomenon happen, that, that we can look at the same thing and totally disagree about its value or what it means or anything else? Yeah, well, I think people form opinions or attitudes based on their own biographies, their own yearnings, their own secret desires, but also the ideology around us what the government tells us is appropriate and not appropriate, and what we're exposed to. Um, the wonderful thing about the kind of work that I've been able to do is to watch kind of the conditions under which people change their points of view and That's interesting. open up to ideas that they never thought they would open up to, whether it's PFLAG, the parents of children who come out as lesbian or gay, or working with synagogues and churches in Westchester County around um, incarceration issues and um, college needs of men and women in prison. Usually the first conversation is pretty hostile and pretty negative, and you can see the conditions under which people begin to kind of open their sense of moral communities and who deserves to be treated with respect and dignity. Um, is that because yeah. there's, I mean, who, who creates the conversation and the, the atmosphere in which that happens? So that's a really good question. <laughs> um, you know, on the one hand, I worry a lot about the ways in which the media is being purchased today by very particular interests that have very particular ideologies same people who are trying to buy elections. Um, so I worry that the kinds of ideas that people are exposed to tend to be very narrow, very anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-gay marriage, that those ideas circulate um, with, with a kind of money and rapidity. I, I worry that my mother, who's 96, knows more about charter schools when only 3% of all children go to charter schools. So I worry about the interests behind a very particular set of ideas. And at the same time, um, I worry that the public spaces where people can come together and um, create new ideas are shrinking, that people aren't, um, don't have access to community centers, that people uh, don't have access to um, branch libraries. Um, in South America, the plaza yeah. is a space where elders sit around and talk about politics and their lives. And, and I worry the shrinkage of public spaces, um, places where we can gather and but we share. But with the internet, ahead. what does that do? That segregates it out and makes it more, it's not coming together, it's really so the internet, I, I, I actually, you know, I'm, um, I actually am very hopeful that the internet is, is a different way of, of distributing ideas and connecting. I certainly know that, um, you know, young people, young native people in New Zealand connect with young native people in Vancouver, connect yeah. with young native people in Arizona. And, um, all, and yeah. suddenly there's an indigenous movement. I know that rural gay and lesbian kids connect up with other gay and lesbian kids. So I do see yeah. the internet as, as certainly a vehicle, but, um, but there's plenty of wonderful stuff and plenty of problematic, yes. very racist, very yeah. homophobic. That's stuff. what I was gonna ask, how do people how, who, how do people who are the, the leaders of the Chamber of Commerce, something like that today, or how, let's take uh, Karl Rove. <laughs> what makes him the way he is? Was it that he came from, we don't know his parents, we don't know what school he went to, but we, all those things went into it? Is so I don't want to blame his down? mother. Somebody's <laughs> gonna want to blame his mother. I don't want to blame his mother. Um, 
I think it's, I think um, people who were raised in privilege, and I don't know how Karl Rove was yeah. raised, but people who are raised in privilege um, have almost a social um, glycoma that, that, that they have to overcome. It's very easy, unfortunately, in this country to live very separate lives. So people raised in privilege can basically never touch, talk to, or interact with except in a restaurant or mm -hmm. perhaps their own um, staff at home, um, people from a different class. Our schools are very segregated, our neighborhoods are segregated. It's a wonderful book by Wilkinson and um, Pickett, Puckett, Pickett, a uh, British epidemiologist called The Spirit Level, and it measures countries in terms of the inequality gaps. And, and the United the great, States the leader. Is, is the leader. And what they argue with Singapore or some other countries that we wouldn't really want to be associated with um, in terms of our own belief about democracy. And what they, what they demonstrate epidemiologically is that the larger the inequality gap, and this is based on income, forget wealth, the higher the rates of crime, illness, mortality, dropout, low civic engagement, it's even a better predictor than the percentage of people who are in poverty because the gap keeps those of us who are privileged from knowing and therefore we can continue to kind of build gated communities and mm -hmm. walls and prisons. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of elite autism about the social issues that are all around well, in, us. In, I mean, in this country, it, it's growing too, the gap. It is the a static is thing, it's growing. Exactly. But along with it, the, the political situation, the number of people incarcerated, the attention to schools, all changes. Now, but a lot of the people who are not in the lower part of the gap, but maybe in the middle, have come from the lower part, right? Yeah. Do we have a history of one group that is somehow enjoying a higher stratum in life, a status in life, looks down or persecutes the ones underneath them? I mean, is that part of the reason that we're getting? I don't understand it. Why are we mean? So it seems to me why we're are mean. We mean. We being the United States? Yeah, I, a lot of people in the United States. Yeah, it's funny, I just had the opportunity to watch you interview yeah. street health workers from Canada right. who, um, Amazing, and my Canadian yeah. colleagues, really bring a different ethic around health care and newcomers and poverty and indigenous people. And it's uh, a lot of people worry about the mm -hmm. Mexican border, but mm -hmm. w we should have that border be more porous. Why are we mean? I think um, I would say at the moment that, that we have a long history of kind of um, sometimes relentless individualism mm -hmm. that has worked against equality it's, and it's social West, movements. The West young men are, and, and that, I also think that at the yeah. moment we are watching the serious privatization and corporatization and greed of all that has been public, whether it's libraries or schools or the military um, or parks. We are watching public spaces become private um, and private for some people's profit, some people's advantage. And we forget that there are circuits that connect us and one person's security is another person's police harassment. So mm. we're watching a kind of bifurcation mm. in every one of our sectors, whether it's housing, you and I mm -hmm. remember the days of mixed income housing, substantial investment in public housing. Now we're not seeing that now. And the housing itself is so expensive that we're pushing and pushing more people into a exactly right. worse place. And schools, I just want to note that we're not saying all people that are wealthy are bad. No, we are not, <laughs> not saying by that. Any some means of my so. best friends are wealthy. <laughs> and some of them are, uh, many of them are doing very good work. And many are very generous. I mean, yeah. this is a funny time yeah. because on the one hand, you know, on the one yeah. hand we have some of the wealthiest people in the world right. in Congress who right. are displaying very mean attitudes. On the other hand, <laughs> we're seeing incredible social philanthropy, uh -huh. some Absolutely. of which is very social justice oriented right. from young people who have inherited family money. Right. We're seeing incredible civic engagement by young people wanting to teach, wanting to be in AmeriCorps, wanting to be in Teach for America. And while I can raise questions about all of those. So maybe I'm, we can't generalize, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. 
I think I, we have to, though. I do think that we are in a moment yeah. where we are, where um, people's status anxiety is being manipulated against immigrants, Muslims, people in prison, people without many resources. Mm -hmm. I worry a lot about mm -hmm. that. I, um, I was recently in Berlin and watched, kind of mm -hmm. been through a whole set of um, museums, and you get to see what happens when there's high so, unemployment and people's anxiety and anger gets targeted to particular groups. And it, it does bring out a, a meanness. Yeah. Somebody mentioned the film Nuremberg to me. I haven't yeah. seen it, but no, I, I haven't. Either. But um, let's. I mean, what is it? Where does it start? <laughs> it starts with a sense of justice, right? Social justice. The people have a very people have some very important common ingredients. Is that fair? Yeah, I think it starts with a sense of justice. It starts with a sense of how wide is your moral community, and that's, um, that's a language yeah. used by psychologist here, Susan Apatow. Who's in your moral, who deserves to be treated with dignity? And I, I have a sense that we're being encouraged, not only by Fox News, but by Fox News, <laughs> to shrink our sense of who's entitled to dignified treatment. So, so when- So immigrant, immigration is certainly- Immigration, prison, People who live in poor neighborhoods, people who um, who don't have access to health care, just a very narrow pool of folks who are presumed to be entitled. And yet, again, at the same time that I watch that shrinkage, I watch organizing happening all over the country mm. that's saying, no, we mm. have to be honest to our democratic roots that say, we have a very wide um, moral compass in this How much country. of the current political thing do you think is racist or based on racism that we have an African-American president? Um, I think we had racism before we had an African-American oh, president. Um, I do think some of it is backlash. I think yeah. some of it's backlash to having a Democrat I mean, in the, the White House. I mean, the concentrated effort of Republicans in the Congress not to allow the president to have any victories in any of his programs, that's can't be just politics. Yeah, yeah. It just that's, can't be. That's relentless. And, and yeah. um, you know, we've seen recently in the papers coverage of kind of who's funding those campaigns. And, you know, you just mentioned the Chamber of Commerce. And yeah. there was some article on the cover of the Times about the percentage of Chamber of Commerce money being used for negative ad right. campaigns Incredible. against Democrats. That's really remarkable. Right. Remarkable. It's, and it goes then to the Supreme Court. <laughs> And it goes because they opened the door for it. Yeah, and the appointments to the court. So every time there's a vacancy, it is really important that people pay attention to that, right? Yeah, it's yeah. an amazing no, thing when you realize where the starting point came and how it all happened. But again, I, I just I want to remind you and, and all of us that um, there's something in psychology called a false consensus that oh, we good. can believe that everybody else thinks some way. Um, and one of the things about false consensus is that it's false. And when you break the silence, mm -hmm. when you dare to say, I don't actually agree with that, mm -hmm. you begin to see other people becoming right. like marble, right? right. That, that people are more complicated. If you're so, brave enough to say, you don't, I don't agree. Exactly. So you, when um, Iraqi veterans come back yeah. and form Iraqi veterans against the war, they're very powerful young men yeah. and women. I don't know if you've had right. the oh, I have privilege of yeah. hearing them. Or when some of us speak, for instance, for college in prison, the very first reaction is college in prison. Are you kidding? They shouldn't have TVs. They shouldn't have barbells. And then you bring in some, some men and women who have been in prison into churches and mosques and synagogues. And I do believe that mostly we want to think about redemption and rehabilitation and transformation. We are living at a time where we're being encouraged to think about punishment and revenge and greed. Um, but I actually think people would like to think about shared fates. You said, you said there was some studies done with different generations of people, that young people are optimistic. How does, I mean, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I see. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of evidence that young people are optimistic and because they um, haven't tried, they still think they can. They change still think, the world. but it's hard to tell what's That's age and what's generation. Uh -huh. I do think that after difficult times, 
you get a group of people who say it must be different. I think we're starting to see pushback all over the country right now where there's mayoral control of schools, mayors are closing schools. Mm -hmm. And you are seeing pushback. Michelle Reed was thrown mm -hmm. out of D.C. In New York City, they wanted to close 20 schools and educators and parents and youth organized say, no, let us transform our schools, but you can't take are we away ever gonna, this Are we resource. ever going to be able to provide a, a meaningful education to everybody? Are we ever? <laughs> will we? Or when will we? When will we? We will when we have finance equity. We will when um, we dare to take seriously that teaching and learning is hard work that requires well-paid educators working collaboratively with communities, treating students mm -hmm. like dignity. We get closer to it when we don't um, link everything to perverse high-stakes tests that we know are over-predicted by race and class and have terrible consequences. So are there places that are doing a much better job? Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely. Right now, New York City is in the clutches of high stakes testing um, and a, a very punishing regime that's disrespectful to educators, parents, and youth, unfortunately. But, uh, but people are really pushing back. Um, mm -hmm. So it is, by a long shot, from my yeah, experience, yeah. the worst of times. But it's also people are, edu <laughs> are, are educating each other in communities. When you, you were talking about in the communities and in your moral, uh, whatever, communities, circumference, yeah. whatever. And then you, th and, and about having the courage to say, you know, I don't agree with something. But then look at the, at the, the women's movement and the civil rights movement and actually the peace movement. But the peace movement had never has achieved what those other groups have had, right. which was sort of the demystification and suddenly the thought, this is not fair. Right. Right. We're the same, right? Right. It's a, it's a very, and, and I think that that kind of thing gets handed down to us in many different ways. You know, pe different um, professions have different language, so you can't understand it, so then the doctor is all important, or the foundations have their way of doing it. You know, you, you never quite feel you're part of that space, and that, in a way, keeps those people up. <laughs> who are in the space, do you know what? Yeah, yeah. Um, but think about the women's movement. Yeah. With all of its, yeah. you know, it was mostly a white women's movement at right. some points, yeah. and at other points it was better at, um, integrated. But there have been amazing accomplishments of the civil rights movement, of feminism, of the right. disability rights movement. Absolutely, that's another and one. And the movement that has survived this decade is the gay rights movement. Yes. Really astonishingly. Right. And, and again, people can disagree about gay marriage. And where they should be. And, and don't ask, don't enough. tell. But it's amazing. Totally it is amazing. transformative. And that should give us hope. Even though we know there's likely to be backlash associated with each of those movements, disability rights as well. You know, you mm -hmm. and I do not go to a new building without seeing mm -hmm. ramps and wheelchairs and sign interpreters. Is there still incredible discrimination? Absolutely. Do people know that it's an issue they have to contend with? Absolutely. Do you, uh, do we have leaders? Do we have and leaders? And this is the other thing, is yeah. that somebody has to have the courage to say at the beginning, this is not right. Right? So does that person become the leader and... <laughs> Yeah. So Ella Baker said strong people don't need, don't need strong leaders. Uh. And I do think we need um, public education in its broadest sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I love those moments at CUNY where we understand that we're about educating the public about yeah. issues that are at the core of democratic multiracial societies. And do we do it perfectly? No. Do we do it better than any other place in the nation? Absolutely. Um, so I think strong people are beginning to lead. I do think that there's a sense of despair. Um, I do think that, I mean, I have a 30-year-old foster son, a 23-year-old, and a 14-year-old C-section sons, uh -huh. right? So they come to me in various ways. <laughs> but I see the sense of, um, my 14-year-old son does not have the same sense that anything is possible in terms of social change. He's a post 9-11 baby. He's a post war on terror baby. Um, and it feels to me like we have to rebuild a sense of 
trust in what's not yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the more I, I work with young people, the more I, I um, am astonished that they so want to create a world that is not yet. Yeah. Um, and, and see themselves that, well, that's as very leaders, isn't it? and see themselves as leaders toward that end, if only they are taken seriously and um, and and supported in the kind of desires. Does our current public school system not um, enlarge people's intelligence? Doesn't have them searching for other. I mean, we had you talked before about we have such segregated communities, right? Right. Uh, my husband and I were driving through Harlem the other day, and and that's beginning to have more. But it's so segregated. It's another right. world. Right. Uh, how do we? So how do we make children who go to school someplace else really know about the yeah. other world? So this is part of that inequality yeah. gap, and I do worry that we're creating kind of gated communities mm -hmm. everywhere, and public institutions of development for elite children and public right. institutions of containment, prisons right. and military for poorer children and children of color. Um, and the whole network, I mean, it's, it gets so enormous that I may be part of that generation that says, oh, it's very, but you know, I'm still looking how to change the world. I mean, it's <laughs> always been the way of life. But, and you've dedicated uh, your career to doing that, to yeah. breaking open conversations and can, and not being some, had. I can see some big changes that, yeah. that came from my participating with other people. You know, youth but, organizing in, in New York City is very powerful. Mm -hmm. There are groups of, of young people working on social issues, um, Brotherhood Sister Soul in Harlem, or Fierce and Fury for That's LGBT right. youth, or yeah. Sister to Sister in the Bronx, yeah. or Educational Video Center. And these are places where young people, sometimes from communities, sometimes across communities, come together to learn how to make films, to learn how to um, work with the local police so that there's not so much police harassment, to uh, girls and gender equity, to work with boys and police and men in their neighborhood to treat them with respect. Um, those are amazing places. I think libraries are an underutilized public resource um, where there could and um, in many places is a lot going on around bringing young people together. So now where where do the young people from, say, Park Avenue, because that's a term everybody knows, where do they come together? And where do they start looking at the other side of the world? Yeah, well, um, sometimes in this building, we bring together <laughs> what we call contact zones, uh -huh. groups of young people from very different zip codes uh -huh. um, and very different biographies to do research together. Oh, that's about. So we do a, a citywide youth survey where we train them to be youth researchers. It's called Polling for Justice. Right. And they've been looking at young people's experiences of education, criminal justice, health care, um, housing, having parents who are incarcerated, et cetera. And it's, it's an eye-opener for the Park Avenue crowd. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that they don't know about drugs. They know about drugs. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> but yeah. they don't know about people who have used drugs who then have to go to prison for using drugs, right? So there's a lot of um, shared behaviors, That's and it. but some groups of young people pay a bigger price for risky yeah. behaviors, and wealthier kids have parents who buy them out of right. those consequences, yeah. and we all, we all know that story. I think summers are a place where we should be thinking about bringing young people together. together. You know, there's Absolutely. lots of good, good evidence that residential integration is good for schools, civic Everything. engagement, et cetera. You know, talk about a segregated community. The Upper West Side is becoming totally. a segregated <laughs> community, right? We just don't notice it as segregated when it's us. Um, but I think summers are a place to begin, or these America Corps, Corps. or these volunteer right. programs right. are really a, a place to Very bring important. young people together. There's lots of work being done with Palestinian and Jewish young people, and we need to attend to making us all recognize our shared fates. When we do, we used to do tours at Bedford Hills Women's mm -hmm. Prison with community people mm -hmm. to meet those women mm -hmm. who could have been their daughters, right, except they got caught with drugs and couldn't buy right. an expensive lawyer to get them out, or could have been their sisters. There's something about that human contact that, that matters profoundly. So the more segregated or gated we are, the more I worry that we lose the important notion that we have shared fates. 
So now, what about our politics? We're not electing people that are seem to be helping us too much. I don't understand. What are we going to do about that? Yeah, well. And, and there seems to be a class condemnation of pol politicians, which is also not a healthy thing because. What do you mean a class condemnation? Well, I mean, the paper, everybody talks about the, um, all the corruption that it's a lousy, you know, every politician is corrupt or every politician is this, so they don't care about us. It's giving politicians a bad name. Yeah. And it's yeah. not encouraging people to go into it. And yeah. also the money part of it. I think the money part of it is, is, the is basic a big problem. Thing, yeah. um, I, I, I don't know why I asked you that, but it just drives me crazy. Because you're worried not about as it. I mean, you want right. your viewers to worry <laughs> about it, too, and we should worry. I worry when groups get demonized in the media, I wonder who's mm -hmm. being protected. So currently mm -hmm. it's teachers, right, right. who are yeah, totally. really suffering right. incredible demonization. Right. And I Terrible. wonder what's the motive behind that, right? Yeah. It's a lack of control, I guess, right? Part well, of it? I don't know. I, you know, in the, when I was younger, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party had broad agendas and they were coalitions of different groups. Right. It seems to me in the last how many years, the groups have, they spring up, but how much do they work together? Yeah. And that's another stage of it. I right? think the coalition, coalition politics Concept. needs a, a lot of invigoration. But I have to say, uh, this summer I taught in Turkey and I traveled in Romania, and um, in both places, people said, how are you dealing with the disappointments uh, of what you expected from the yeah. Obama administration? Yeah. Not really laying the responsibility just at his feet, yeah. but what hasn't happened. Um, so it's not it's just a disappointment explain. here, it's yeah. a disappointment globally in a place like Romania, or Turkey, where they really want us yeah, to be there. They really want us with a black president to be um, rising up for civil rights and human rights and the right to the city. Um, uh, well, we can't give up hope, right? Isn't we that what cannot said? give up right. hope. There are young people who are who are um, eager to lead the way with us. So if only we can fight our own despair. We've come to the end of this program. It's wish, been a pleasure. I wish I was a pupil of yours or a student in one of your classes or program, um, but I will encourage other people to be. Thank you so much, Michelle Fine. Thank you, Michelle Ronnie. Fine. A pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.